Welcome to this series, The Foundational Questions of Our Time, brought to you by Synergy Circles of the Evolutionary Leaders, specifically the Integral and Holistic Cosmology Synergy Circle and the Cornerstone Synergy Circle. These discussions feature global thought leaders dialoguing with renowned author Rian Eisler on how their transformational work relates to Dr. Eisler's four cornerstones of how we transform cultures from domination consciousness to partnership consciousness, crucial for these challenging times. I'm Dr. Kurt Johnson of Light on Light Publications and Media. Each video will engage Dr. Eisler in a discussion with a global thought leader introduced immediately after this initial introduction of Rian Eisler. Rian Eisler, JD, PhD, is a best-selling author, system scientist, futurist, cultural historian, and attorney, whose work shows how to build a more equitable, sustainable, and less violent world. Her famous book, The Chalice and the Blade, Our History, Our Future, is now in 57 U.S. printings and 30 foreign editions. Dr. Eisler is president of the Center for Partnership Systems, CPS, and editor-in-chief of the Interdisciplinary Journal of Partnership Studies at the University of Minnesota. She is also the author of Nurturing Our Humanity, How Domination and Partnership Structure Our Brains, Lives, and Future, co-authored with anthropologist Dr. Douglas Fry, Oxford University Press, 2019 and The Real Wealth of Nations, Creating a Caring Economics, hailed by Nobel Peace Laureate Archbishop Desmond Tutu as the template for the better world that we are so urgently seeking. In short, according to dictionaries, a domination hierarchy is a social hierarchy arising when interaction of members of a social system creates a ranking system. Such rankings of who are favored can involve gender, race, economic status, and so on. Dr. Eisler's four cornerstones of how we shift from domination consciousness to partnership consciousness are these. And we invite you to hear our first video with Dr. Eisler in which she elaborates these four elements. The first cornerstone is childhood. The second cornerstone is the attitude toward gender. The third cornerstone is economics, and the fourth cornerstone is story and language. So let's go over now to introduce our guest for this episode. guest for this episode is Dr. Paul J. Mills. Paul J. Mills, PhD, is Professor of Public Health and Family Medicine, and Director of the Center for Excellence for Research and Training in Integrative Health, and former Chief of Behavioral Medicine at the University of California, San Diego. He has over 400 scientific publications in the fields of pharmacology, oncology, cardiology, behavioral medicine, and integrative health. He published some of the earliest scientific research on meditation. His work has been featured in Time Magazine, the New York Times, National Public Radio, US News and World Report, Consumer Reports, The Huffington Post, Gaia TV, WebMD, and so many more. And he's presented his work at hundreds of conferences and workshops around the world, including at the United Nations. His Gold Nautilus Award-winning book, Science, Being, and Becoming, The Spiritual Lives of Scientists, includes interviews with some of the world's foremost scientists and physician scientists who recount their own transpersonal, metaphysical, and mystical experiences and how these experiences transformed their scientific work and their lives. 
Their accounts teach us that the long-standing divide between science and spirituality is actually false, and that science can fulfill an intended promise to help us discover and understand all of life, including consciousness and our spiritual nature. So let's go over now to Dr. Rian Eisler and Dr. Paul J. Mills. So we're here with Dr. Rian Eisler and Dr. Paul J. Mills, who we've just told you so much about. And it's a unique opportunity having them both here together. So we want to center our sharing on two matters that are central to their work. The first is what they have in common in this discussion, of the foundational questions of our time and the spiritual lives of scientists about the relationship of science and the values of love, kindness, mutuality, and so on, that are characteristic of the central message of the world's great wisdom traditions. This relationship of science and love in the greatest sense is certainly central to this journey to partnership consciousness on a global scale. Mm. And secondly, because Dr. Eisler's late husband, Dr. David Elliott Loy, was himself a pioneer in the post-Darwinian holistic science movement, we want Dr. Eisler to share about his contributions and bring them into the discussion. An entire issue of the interdisciplinary journey of partnership studies from the University of Minnesota was recently devoted to his holistic work. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we're also going to want to discuss. So let's start by asking each of Rian and Paul about the relationship of science and the deeper aspects of our humanness, love, kindness, mutuality, and so on, that lead to partnership consciousness. So Paul, this relationship of science and spirit has been your life's work. How would you describe it? Mm. Thank you, Kerr. It's a pleasure to be with you today and also with you, Jan. How would I describe that? I love that uh, that that phrase, the deeper aspects of our humanness. And, and for me, really, Kurt, that that's what drove me to science, to enter into science. I wanted to use science as a as a method, a, a systematic way of knowing, of exploring my own deepest nature. And for me, I'll I'll use the term my spiritual nature, my my metaphysical nature, my mystical nature, really. And my journey started when I was young. I was in high school and I'd learned meditation. It was transcendental meditation. That's what was um, sweeping the US and, the, and really the globe at the time. And within a couple of short months of practicing it, I found myself in the midst of experiences that I had never even heard of, let alone experienced. And that's what really drove me to science. And then I described some of that story in my book. And so for me, science is about discovering and probing and exploring the nature of my own spiritual life, but more broadly, really that of uh, humanity, of, of the human being itself. And that, that's that been my journey. And my book, as you know, I interviewed many scientists, and they shared with me parallel stories that that was really inner spiritual experiences of their deep humanness that led them to become a scientist. Or if they were already a scientist, and they had some kind of experience prompted by some an inspiration or many paths that they opened up to that deep humanness and that then began to change their science so for me that that's really the, the foundational reason for science but but science as we know <clears throat> it hasn't done a good job historically recently of exploring it but when i when i think about back on its roots back you know 5 centuries ago when western science as we know it was starting there, there was more of that impulse, I think, in the early scientists, Bruno, Galileo, others. They had certainly a deep religious life. But if you read some of their work, they, there was a the spiritual life, a soulful life there too. And they wanted to use science to understand the nature of the universe as more of a, a reflection of God, a, a, spirit, a spiritualness, not just a dead materialistic point of view, which is more common today. And and that that's really what I'll say at this point. I, I I'm working as best as I can to help kind of resurrect that approach to science and that appreciation. Uh, we as human beings were often described as mind, body, spirit, and 
mind check. Science has been exploring that a lot, a long time, psychology, psychiatry, and on and on. The body, certainly Western medicine is very good, but we haven't used the tools of science systematically to start probing really the spirit, not on a broad scale. And that's what I want to see uh, be done. Yeah, so Rian, Paul has just set really a great context for discussing what you're famous for, how our world can move from dominance consciousness to partnership consciousness. So tell us about that and your concept of the core cornerstones for that journey. Well, thank you. And thank you, Paul, for sharing that. Uh, I will digress a moment from your question uh, to really uh, tell you how very much your thinking uh, is congruent with the thinking of my late husband, mm. uh, Dr. David Loy. Uh, and maybe we can talk about that uh, in some detail later, uh, because he was both a deeply spiritual man and a scientist, a very dedicated social scientist who, unlike many social scientists, was interested in morality. Mm -hmm. And he felt that we have given away morality, given away this core concept to people pushing us back to what I call a domination rather than a partnership system. So he made a distinction between what he called partnership moral sensitivity and domination moral insensitivity. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, uh, Kurt, um, my research uh, really has identified uh, four cornerstones which are uh, ignored or at least certainly marginalized in most of social science. Um, and they are childhood and family. And of course, as a neuroscientist uh, and coming from neuroscience, you know that that's totally inaccurate because uh, our early experiences uh, are so fundamental to nothing less than how our brains, the architecture of our brains develops, uh, and hence how we feel, how we think, how we act, even how we vote. And my work explores that in great detail, especially in my book, my latest book, um, with anthropologist Douglas Fry called Nurturing Our Humanity, mm -hmm. uh, How Domination and Partnership Shape Our Brains, Lives, and Future. So the second cornerstone, which is also still marginalized uh, in science, social science, is gender, which from the perspective of the new methodology that I've introduced, which is the whole systems methodology that doesn't marginalize the majority of humanity, women and children, and hence where they were not so long ago, uh, confined to ideologically the family, right? So these cornerstones are very interconnected. So gender, I see as not just a women's issue, which is kind of a strange way of looking at them, what are really uh, the, the majority of people are female uh, on our planet, um, but it is a core organizing principle for social and economic operating systems, because there is, if we really think about it, in our we, in what we have inherited in both capitalism and socialism, a gendered system of values in which what is coded as feminine, you know, are caring for people, starting at birth, uh, keeping a clean and healthy home environment, which translates into keeping uh, a clean and healthy planetary environment, our Mother Earth, uh, they coded that as just reproductive rather than productive. So it's inferior. And of course, this affects economics. I mean, you always have money, if we really think about it, um, for welfare prisons. 
Well, who is that? Archetype of domination systems of the punitive father, the male head of household, right? But somehow there isn't enough money to care for people, to feed children, uh, to nurture them. That quote, women's, quoted women's work. I mean, it's changing, but at a glacial pace globally. And fourth, of course, is story and language, because we humans, and this really, I think these cornerstones relate to what you're talking about, because uh, we are born really with empathy. I mean, it, 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 the studies shows that, for example, uh, that babies cry more when they hear another baby cry newborns yeah. than when they hear their own cry. I mean, it, it, it is not only, as, as David Loy really pointed out in his many, many books, uh, it is not just what we are taught, but it taps into something that we come equipped with. Mm -hmm. So, um, so as you can see, uh, in terms of, and I'll stop in a moment, my view of story and language in particular is that we've been told false stories of, quote, human nature, mm -hmm. whether it's original sin or whether it's selfish genes, mm -hmm. it comes to the same. It's the same story. They fight each other, but really, it's the same story, isn't it? We're bad. That's just human nature. So we have to be rigidly controlled from the top, as in God-fearing. Yeah. And that is not true spirituality. That is morality and spirituality as defined in domination rather than partnership-oriented societies mm -hmm. and families, I should add, and religion and politics and economics. Yeah, well, Rian, what I'm going to do actually is depart just a, a moment from our format because we're going to go next to talking about uh, David Elliott Loy, but I just wanted to give Paul a chance now to respond to just what you just said now about this connection between uh, spirituality and this understanding of the the movement toward partnership consciousness mm -hmm. and the four cornerstones. So, Paul? Yeah, very much so. I, I, everything you stated, I, I appreciated, Rian, particularly the end, you just used those terms, these false stories. And honestly, science, from my point of view, Western science, materialistic science, has been propagating a false story parallel to all the stories and in some ways embedded within the stories that you were just describing. For me, the major false story is the story of separation and materialism of the human being, of the earth herself, of the universe herself. And that narrative of separation has led to so many problems. And really, this loss, I know we'll speak about moral sensitivity a little bit later, but science and many many of the scientific endeavors that I've tracked during my career, it's been not deeply embedded in a, in a moral perspective. I, there's so many examples of where science has led to different technologies. It could be certain kinds of pesticides, herbicides, biologics, uh, on and on, where we, we either we know that they're not good for the human being or the animal or the insect or the earth, but we roll them out anyway because there's profit to be made. Or if we made something and we didn't know in the beginning, and I, I've done a lot of research in the world of herbicides and have tracked this as, as like a side interest. And maybe at the beginning, we didn't know they were bad, but then this data, data starts coming in year after year. Well, we just keep it out there anyway, because it's a good moneymaker. So this to me is a huge false narrative and it's, it, it's a separation. And, and we need to get the scientific endeavor reintegrated back to this, we could call it a moral sensitivity, we can call, call it an ethic, we can call it having scientists in touch with their own soul life so that their work would be, you know, better directed. And these kinds of things wouldn't be uh, permitted internally, and therefore externally. Like, can I just briefly respond, because you have really, this whole values neutral approach, that is supposed to be embedded in science is, is another false story, because we know that every one of us comes with a certain set of values. So it, it is a lie 
really, to be very blunt. But unfortunately, uh, it has led to exactly what you're talking about. The system rewards uh, materialism. Uh, it rewards uh, <laughs> really uh, this values neutral perspective, as long as you make a, quote, profit, with profit defined solely in mm -hmm. terms of accumulating more and more and more, when, as you noted, what we humans want and need is caring connection from, from the day we are born, really. Mm -hmm. we, we need this because without some degree of care, as we see in so many of the studies of, of orphanages in Romania, for example, or in China, where they get rote attention, they wither, they die, and their brains, I mean, again, mm -hmm. uh, develop in a way that is really, uh, I mean, it's it's tragic what happens. So you, we we are certainly very uh, much allied in our thinking in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm just going to continue on that tack for a moment. Throw it back to Paul because in so many commentaries about what birthed your book was the curiosity, particularly of younger and up and coming in scientists who were having experiences far broader and deeper than in just the narrow line of materialist science, and they would come to you because you were an ear that was ready to hear that and discuss that not only from your own rich spiritual background, but from your knowledge of neuroscience and the sciences itself. So you've really birthed an entire new track here about this straddle. So say a little bit more about your experience with that. Yeah, you're, you're, you're so right, Kurt. That really was a, one of the major inspirations for me to write the book. There are many young scientists, and and why is this happening? I can conjecture. I uh, I know that there's been more and more waves of meditation techniques available to people. Yoga, we've seen that. I've seen it going through the university where I've worked for decades, and I think that naturally begins to open up uh, some of our inner kingdom, let's say, or inner domain, some aspects of our soul life, and then questions start arising and. And, and they wanted to figure out ways to pursue that in the context of their science. But, but that might seem silly on first hand, because, well, why not just do it? But there are all kinds of stated and unstated barriers, certainly more, let's say, materialistically oriented universities and institutions, where this stuff is just considered woo-woo. If you start speaking about the spiritual, certainly the metaphysical and mystical, it's going to have an adverse effect on your career, your academic advancement, maybe your ability to get grants, which is huge. So yes, I, I so enjoyed, and I'm, I'm pleased that I, somehow I got that reputation. So yeah, they would be knocking on my door, and we'd chat, and I would do my best to encourage them to pursue going forward, give them advice. Well, you know, you can do this, but maybe don't go this direction so much, at least not for now. And over time, that really led to a kind of a blossoming for them. And, and many of them now are able to have a balance to, to go deeply into their science, which in, innately is um, reductionistic, but to keep a larger perspective in their work, a perspective on more the livingness of, of their work in relationship to the broader holes. And I think there's more creativity in that ultimately, and certainly inspiration. Yeah, absolutely. And what it does, of course, it reaches into the broader, you know, nature of our of our humanness. And this is what can lead to the segue now to talk about David Elliott Loy's work. So uh, you already referred, uh, Rianne, to the groundbreaking holistic work of your late husband, Dr. David Elliott Loy, who is a pioneer in the post-Darwinian discussion of science and spirit and such a pioneer quite ahead of his time. So could you tell us about the key areas of his work and more about his contributions? And especially so that can let Paul then comment on David's work and how it appears so closely parallel to his own work. So, Brian. Well, David, as I said, was a deeply spiritual social scientist. And he had the courage in his book, particularly in this particular book, The Sphinx and the Rainbow, later it came out as Arrow Through Chaos, to actually uh, include in, he was always interested in how we can foretell the future. 
and not just the quote scientific approaches, but what is classified as paranormal. And um, in fact, when Selma Moss, David uh, was a professor um, at the School uh, of Medicine at UCLA. Uh, he was in charge of a large study on how television affects adult behavior. And yes, it does, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, was his finding. Uh, and when Selma Moss got booted out, uh, you know who she was, I assume. Yes. Uh, Selma Moss, uh, for those who don't know, studied paranormal phenomena. And she was booted out of the UCLA School of Medicine. David took over one of her groups uh, on studying mental telepathy. And they would meet. That's that's I mean, I remember when, when David and I first met, he took me to these meetings in the basement, you know, in the bowels, really of the UCLA School of Medicine, where this small group would meet, uh, and we would study empirically, really, uh, mental telepathy. And I was a very, oh, much of a skeptic, and I am still uh, very skeptical of ghosts and, you know, all of this sort of stuff, you know, seances and what have you. But I have to tell you that I experienced mental telepathy. Uh, there was you were supposed to uh, figure out how uh, something about a, a quote person, a subject, right? And for some bizarre reason, I came up with telephone books, which is not something that you usually come up with, right? Mm -hmm. And it turned out that this person had been going through telephone books like crazy recently looking for an a her birth mother mm. and and it may not be reliable in fact it really isn't reliable or we would have people predicting the stock market reliably but it's there it's there but uh david's passion really uh was as i said more moral sensitivity and Darwin, because when you said post-Darwinian, Kurt, uh, another false story has been how Darwin has been interpreted. And David, in his books, and particularly in Darwin's Lost Theory, shows how in the books that Darwin wrote on human evolution, what he called the descent of man, uh, he distanced himself from this term, um, survival of the fittest. In fact, what David did, which is really amazing, he used a then new methodology, which was computer word count. And he, uh, in that book, uh, put in um, the term uh, survival of the fittest, and he found that Darwin only used it twice in his later book, and once it was to apologize for using it. But love, he, Darwin mentioned 95 times, even though the index only has one or two entries for it to that book. And uh, the same thing was for what Darwin called the moral sense. Uh, and 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 Darwin said that I am now going to talk about human evolution, and he said that I mean really he was talking about cultural evolution to a very large extent, and the interaction between culture and biology, which is again another false story because it isn't nature or nurture, it is as you know very well uh, how our brains develop, how our genetic qualities are realized, depends on the interaction of our genes with our environment, as yes, as mediated through families, through religion, through education, but very much through families in those first five years or so. So uh, really, uh, in fact, David even uh, showed how uh, aligned in some ways, Darwin in that later book was 
uh, with chaos theory and nonlinear dynamics because he's talked about self-organizing, that we don't just adapt, quote unquote, but that we interact. Mm. And it's fascinating. You know, I mean, here was this scientist coming out of a time when people, I mean, there were some ways in which Darwin was a creature of his time. But in other ways, he was so ahead of his time. And uh, David really uh, brought all of that out. Uh, so his social science uh, was always informed by what you would call our spiritual nature, our uh, impulse towards what we call the good or of love. Um, but it's been so dis it is so distorted in the in our heritage from earlier, more rigid domination times. And in contrast, I, I and I will stop here uh, to the really what we are now learning was the earliest direction of our cultural evolution, foraging societies, which um uh, and that's why I invited him to be my co-author, among other things, which Douglas Fry uh, and others have called the original partnership societies, because they were uh, amazing the, to us, gender-balanced, uh, non, you know, not top to bottom, but, you know, linking rather than ranking. Um, and yes, much more peaceful, much more peaceful. And my first book from this study, The Chalice and the Blade, uh, which is now in, I think it's 20, no, no, it's 57th U.S. printing and about 26 foreign editions, really uh, talks about places like Chatal Huyak and other earlier civilizations, even uh, Minoan civilization that's still oriented more to the partnership side. So we it's a configuration, not simple linear causes and effects that my work describes. And I think that it's a frame that I hope more people can use because it makes what seems hopeless sometimes much more hopeful. Yeah, absolutely. So well, I want to go now to Paul commenting also about uh, David Loy's work. But what I want to do is catch the audience up a little bit, is that as of about 2015, mainstream science finally de redefined its its definition of survival of the fittest based on the understanding of group and multi-level natural selection. So survival of the fittest is true, but what happens is the definition of fitness changes as a system complexifies. So when you get up to the higher orders of living organisms like ourselves, the definition of fitness is not competition. The definition of fitness then turns to uh, cooperation. And this is where David uh, was a pioneer in writing about this years and years before this mainstream. I had been actually in correspondence with David Loy for five years uh, and didn't know that he was Rian's partner. It was actually when I started working with Rian that I suddenly realized, oh, gosh, these two were 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 a couple because I'd been tracking the same thing. And all of us know that's really David Sloan Wilson and E.O. Wilson who mainstreamed this understanding of of the the, the movement from the definition of fitness from uh, competition to cooperation. And uh, that's actually how I uh, met David Sloan Wilson as I'd written a book in 2013, The Coming Inner Spiritual Age, that based on that view of moving toward partnership consciousness, was, was about the whole emergence of the interfaith movements and the inner spiritual movements across all the world's religions to bring us into that partnership instead of these silos that were at war with each other. And actually David Sloan Wilson in reading that book then called me and said, hey, this is exactly what should happen with religion if group selection and multi-level selection is acting. It should be driving it toward a partnership consciousness and away from domination silos. So it's really interesting that how David was so ahead of his time. So, Paul, I know you've taken a look into David Loy's work and then everything that Rian just said. So please comment mm -hmm. yourself about uh, David and all of his work. Yeah. 
Happy to. Uh, a couple of things come to mind. The first one is speaking about this, the the, the association, as you were describing, Rhiannon, and moving away from competition and separation and getting back into partnership. As I think about that, that's the kind of science that absolutely naturally emerges when a person has been, let's say, more awakened to their own spiritual nature, when they see the livingness of whatever it is they're doing research on whether it's ecology, whether it's certain types of animals, certain types of insects, you know, plants and so forth. When, when the scientist is more awakened to the reality of the livingness of other things, and I don't just mean biologically, but I mean the deep sentient nature of all things, that is more of a partnership model of science. And that's where real, from my point of view, discovery emerges, because we get to understand more of the innate nature of what it is we're studying beyond the dimension of just the senses. And also getting back to what I spoke of earlier, this, this tendency from the materialistic has been to create things that are not always supportive of life. Rianne, I saw your TEDx uh, lecture from a couple of years ago about the economy, and you described how the, the GDP everything's thrown into there, whether it's war, whether it's prisons, whether it's how many drugs have been sold, it's all a huge mashup. And it doesn't differentiate things that support human well-being and health. It, it all goes in. If the number is going up, that's great, regardless of what's driving it, even if it's something that's destroying the world or cultures, civilization. And in many ways, a materialistic science does the same thing due to that, that mentality of just progress and discovery, despite whatever that particular discovery might be. So I find that scientists who are more in touch with their, their inner spiritual nature don't go in that direction so easily. They're guided more naturally to want to research things and make discoveries that are life supportive, that are more in collaboration, cooperation. They also form better, more collaborative um, scientific groups, I've found. And a lot of the scientists that I interviewed in my book are highly successful, and they uh, work well in teams. And it's not it's not the um, competition side so much. It's really just the thrill of discovery and trying to make the world a better place and being vigilant that whatever the heck they're doing is actually doing that. And they're not creating things um, that, that aren't supporting that. And, and I'll just briefly add one other thing. As I understand the moral sensitivity side, there has been a movement within the sciences in the last, well, let's say, 20 years or so, maybe a little bit more, to begin to clean up some of the scientific endeavor because there's been a fair amount of science done that hasn't been uh, without conflict of interest and conflict of interest between, say, an academic person and a company they founded or a company they're working for outside of academia. This has led to a lot of problems a lot of uh, false scientific papers being published, um, manipulating data, and so forth. So there, as far as a moral awakeness, that had kind of gone to sleep for a while, but there's efforts to revitalize that now in science. And I had put together a lecture on this some years ago and was giving it at different universities. And also speaking to the deans of, of our medical school and other schools to try to change the pressure on just cranking out research for the sake of the numbers and moving more towards a higher quality of research that we'd have more, uh, let's say, confidence in, yeah, and that would also have more of a beneficial social effect. Yeah, no, yeah. thanks so much. And Rihanna, how would you like to respond to that? Say a little bit more about David in that context. Um, hmm. and your well, I think David naturally naturally look, moved in that direction of being aware of interconnection. But I want to say also that David um, was very uh, much influenced by the work, uh, the, the research uh, 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 of, of a pioneer in this area, which uh, really, uh, I think he saw science not as something morally or ethically or values neutral, but as an instrument mm -hmm. for making ours a better world. 
And I think that uh, that is so lacking in the academy that uh, ethos, well, the partnership ethos really of recognizing our interconnection, uh, which we know from how trees, big trees support little trees. I mean, mm-hmm. it, 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 it's coming out. But, but one thing that I really find very difficult uh, in the academy is the siloed nature of it. Because it is really impossible to understand uh, domination systems and partnership systems which transcend right, left, religious, secular, eastern, western, northern, southern, which none of them describe the whole of a society, and they marginalize the majority of humanity, women and children, but so does science as as it has developed. And even gender studies or or uh, uh, child development, they're in, in, a, in a siloed little, you know, place. Rather, well, I mean, first of all, gender studies are brand new. And what was it? Some state just abolished gender studies? Florida. Florida. Yeah, Florida is wonderful, wonderful Florida. I mean, it is uh, really trying to get us, I mean, if you really look at it, it's top-down rule in both the family and the state or tribe. I mean, why did Putin, for example, uh, uh, substantially lower the penalty for family violence? Because he gets the connection between an authoritarian, rigidly male-dominated, highly punitive, violent family and that kind of a state. But you can't get the connection as long as the academy is so siloed. Because you have all these studies now on trauma, for example. But they are only focused uh, on individual families. And that's not, families don't just arise out of no place. Mm -hmm. Like other institutions, like education, religion, politics, economics, families arise and are interconnected with, they influence and are influenced by the larger social system. And they're very different. I mean, you see trends towards partnership today, for example, authoritative rather than authoritarian. Um, The American Academy of, of Psychology, I think it was, finally said that spanking is harmful, that it is ineffective, as a means of discipline, but that it is psychologically and physically harmful. Yet worldwide, I mean, uh, the amount of violence against children worldwide is staggering. Abs- I mean, I have that in in nurturing our humanity, and for some reason, we don't connect that violence. I mean, what do children really learn? in that top-down violent family that it's okay for those who are bigger, stronger to use violence to impose their will on those who are smaller, weaker. Very simple lesson. But you you have to connect the dots. So anyway. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. And for those of you that are following the video series from various light on light authors, which is the series is a part of, uh, we just recorded one uh, two days ago with the chair of the yoga committee at the United Nations and our author Karuna exactly on this, uh, this thing about the issues of women and girls worldwide, in contrast to the artistic values of yoga. So isn't it interesting that yoga is embedded around the world, working innately against this dominance and this punitiveness and that and coming from the heart. But it's one thing that's coming down, the other trying to come up. So the other thing I'm going to do is in the credits page, everybody, of the video here, I will put the link to the uh, the transdisciplinary journal that was dedicated to David Loy's life and work so that people want to refer to that. You'll have the link. So let's move toward closing out with just a final thing I want both of you to comment that kind of rolls everything into really an interesting way to cap off. And that is, given everything that both of you have done, and along with also uh, David Loy's work, 
on this transition uh, toward deeper moral sensitivity, more more humanness and the sense of love and moving toward partnership from dominance. What would you say you think the major changes are that need to happen to actually move the world toward away from dominance cultures and toward partnership cultures? It's a huge question, but we'd just love to hear what you think are the major things that would need to change there. So we'll start with Paul, which would allow then Rian to, to wrap mm -hmm. up. Yeah, that is a, that is a big question, and and as you were putting it together, I was just pondering just the the efforts of our conversation here about the nature of science and how has it been unfolded historically in the West, and what can change about it? How can it um, be modified so that it's more life supportive, less siloed? Uh, you were referring to the silos, Rianne, and that is uh, something that's been a big effort actually the last decade or more within. But then certainly the biomedical sciences to overcome silos for the for the purpose of advancing certain kind of research. But as far as your question, Kurt, gosh, I'm in kind of a simple kind of thinking these days, and, and it gets back to the spiritual side of things. And I would just like to see uh, more scientists begin to have permission from their own selves to pursue really what often is called spiritual development. And within that, that, that's what changes a person. And when a person is changed, then the type of science they do changes, how they interact with other people changes, how they are in the world changes. And Rian, you were mentioning, you know, being a skeptic until, well, you had a little experience of this telepathy. It's, it's experience that opens us up to what's new and what's beyond. And, and again, many of the scientists in the book, they had been very materialistic. They've been skeptical about lots of things, and then suddenly something happened. A change, an opening occurred, and based on direct experience, they then knew, oh, there is something beyond this third dimension of my perception, and I want to begin to understand it because it's very meaningful to me. And that really led to many journeys. So that, that's really what I'll say at that point to your question, Kurt. Yeah. I just, How do we get to we awaken? Yeah, and just before I go to Rihanna, I'll say, yeah, this is what I see now in the in the current scientific conversation, that even if people don't want to talk about spiritual dimensions or those other things, they want to talk now about caring and love and caring all the way from bottom up, global wide. That, that caring then is bringing out that deep humanness that joins the wisdom traditions and the original purpose of science to find out about reality and joins them in a way that moves toward a, a holistic and partnership uh, global mm -hmm. culture. So, Rian, you're perfect to sum up because you have actually laid out the four cornerstones of this transition. And as you point out when you commented about Putin, it's the same four cornerstones that are used to maintain the system that are also needed to change to move the system the other way. So in your summary, then, just uh, take it away with what you'd like to say about what, what needs to change. Well, I think that we, to really go back to David Loy, uh, we need to make a distinction between a partnership spirituality and a dominator spirituality. Um, and if we don't make that distinction and we lump everybody who believes that there is an afterlife or whatever or doesn't, uh, that's not the point. The point really is what kind you know it used to be spirituality used to talk about a veil of tears right on this earth and that all that matters well i mean you see it in the in in, in you know life before death be, before we're born and after we die that's what's important but never mind don't bother me with real children uh you know i mean florida um uh, you know and real children okay real people so i think that the distinction between these two social configurations uh, is is vital mm -hmm. and it really is vital also in spirituality i this is this is my opinion is that uh it isn't just any spirituality i mean the santos may say he's very spiritual but i would really uh, say that, yeah, he's got a dominator spirituality down to a T. 
Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> but so what? I mean, that's not what we need. Uh, I, I think that what we need is to understand, number one, that we the domination institutions that we have inherited mm-hmm. are really taking us to, the, to an evolutionary dead end. Um, you know, that all the progressive social movements are the Enlightenment, the feminist movement, the movement against colonialism, against uh, prejudice, the environmental movement, they challenge traditions of domination, every last one of them. So let's then look at the four cornerstones. Stop pretending that the family and gender are just, you know, oh, they're not important. Let's remember, you know, there's a book that I really like, it's called The World Without Women by a, a historian of science, um, uh, David Winter, I think his name is. Mm-hmm. And he wrote, it was a world without women that was the beginning of Western science, you know, a clerical, monastic, misogynist culture. And I would say it was not only a world without women, but also a world without children. Mm-hmm. And so let's really think of love and not as a quote women's thing but as a human quality caring as a fundamental human quality and think of all the endorphins these guys who are doing mothering instead of you know i mean diapering babies feeding babies are getting right i mean just from a neuroscientific standpoint we we a biology gives us rewards for caring. We feel Mm. good when we love um, a a friend, a partner, a husband, a wife, even a pet. So this is human nature. Let's change our families uh, and really pay attention to childhood. Let's pay attention to this gender ranking of of one form of humanity over the other, it's a template for in-group versus out-group thinking for equating difference, whether it's based on race, religion, whatever, sexual orientation, uh, on either dominating or being dominated, on either being superior or inferior, on either being served or serving. That's domination heritage, isn't it? So I would say that these are cornerstones, family and childhood, gender, economics. We need, as I point out in my book, The Real Wealth of Nations, subtitle is Creating a Caring Economics. We need to give value and reward the work of caring for people starting at birth, really reward it, and caring for our natural life support systems. And Neither capitalism nor socialism, as I mentioned in passing, really do that. Uh, And GDP and GMP are nuts. I mean, really, I mean, a log, I mean, a tree isn't even part of GDP only when it's dead, when it's a log. I mean, it's, it's kind of, let's stand reality right side up again. And let's recognize that we humans need caring connection and that our interconnectedness is really something that people are even getting Nobel Prizes for these days. But let's connect the dots. And we come back to the distinction between dominator spirituality and partnership spirituality. And I think what you write about, Paul, is really partnership spirituality. Uh, Yes. I mean, from my point of view, spirituality is nothing but connectedness. A person who is spiritually awake knows and experiences themselves to be connected to everyone and everything. There's no longer a a separation because it's within separation that you get this domination and and, and everything else that that goes subsequent to that. Absolutely. And I think that uh, we need to really uh, have the new frame that takes into account the whole human population and the whole of what is our human nature. All right, so, so thank you so much for uh, this discussion. Actually, Paul, you were 
your mouth was moving, so I'm going to actually go back to you. Yeah, you had something else to throw in? No, no, I was finished. I was just going to say I really appreciate uh, your your points and summary there, Rian. No, absolutely. Thank you. And I really appreciate the direction that your work takes us in and hopefully can take science in, because science uh, has a huge impact, even though, I mean, there's a, what is it, denial you know, science, denial of climate change, denial of election results, denial of COVID, they're part of the domination mentality, you know, the strongman identification with the strongman savior, leader, you know, starts in families, doesn't it? This denial. So we, uh, we have a lot of work to do, but uh, there are people who are doing it. And that's, as David said, we're he wrote an article. I really want to end with that. Uh, for in 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 the nineties, he was so prescient. He said he predicted a period of tremendous upheavals, and we're going through it right now. But that somehow the survival instinct, really, of our species in this time of climate change, in this time of weapons that could lead to human extinction. Uh, that uh, we're waking up and uh, hopefully we'll wake up in time. That was his hope, as it is, I think, all the hope of all three of us. Yeah, absolutely. Indeed. So uh, thank you for joining us for this discussion, Dr. Paul J. Mills and Dr. Rian Eisler. And if all of you want to learn more ab about Paul and his work, Please go to his first episode in his video series, The Spiritual Lives of Scientists, which you'll find both at the uh, 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 YouTube channel of the Evolutionary Leaders and the YouTube channel of Sacred Stories. And then also Rian's first episode in her series, The uh, Foundational Questions of Our Time, which is also both at the Sacred Stories YouTube channel and the Evolutionary Leaders YouTube channel. And those will be on the credits page. So. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks again, Paul and Rian. It's great that that we just had this wonderful discussion. Yeah, thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Rian. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rian Eisler, and to our viewers. Each of the subsequent videos in this important video series will feature global thought leaders and activists discussing their work in the context of the Four Cornerstones with Dr. Eisler. And you can update yourself regularly on the series at the websites that will be posted just hereafter. And these include lightonlight.us, centerforpartnership.org, evolutionaryleaders.net. Thank you for joining us, and please tell your colleagues about this important video series. This is Dr. Kurt Johnson of Light on Light Media and of the Synergy Circles of the Evolutionary Leaders, a project of the Source of Synergy Foundation. And please also see our emerging work at holomovement.org. That's H-O-L-O -O movement.org. <laughs>